Thank you for attending today. We will begin our formal presentation in a few seconds as we wait for a few more guests to join in. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar hosted by Next Time. Before we begin, please note that you are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions, please share them with us through the question box on the control panel. We will address your queries towards the end of the webinar or in writing if time does not permit us to cover them during the session. I would now like to invite Mr. Mayank Lakhani, Senior Managing Director, Next Time. Thank you, Jitin. Hello, everyone. We heartily welcome all participants who have joined us today from across the globe for this webinar. With us today are professionals from Brazil, US, UAE, India, Cambodia, UK, and many other countries. We are happy to see that you have spared the time to gather thoughts and perspective from the discussion in this webinar. It feels great to be amongst distinguished speakers who will bring in rich experience to the discussion today on the global anti-bribery and corruption landscape in current times. Across geographies, regulatory environments are changing, business practices are evolving, and behaviors are changing with the current pandemic. Anti-corruption in the current environment is bringing newer dimension with issues around supply chain, healthcare, and other reporting requirements. This also extends to regulatory interventions in current times and the new virtual world in the corruption fight. Today we have with us Amy and Tom, both of whom need no introduction given their stalwart reputation of having deep knowledge and extensive experience in dealing with the ethics and compliances. Emmy is an executive coach, strategic advisor, and keynote speaker who specializes in accelerating the success of compliance and legal executives. She has been a key influencer for ethics and compliance leadership. Her role as a coach for legal and compliance team have been widely recognized by Forbes. She brings in critical thoughts around leadership influences to drive compliance and creating stellar engagement across levels. Thanks, Amy, for joining. Thank you. Uh, Tom is a key voice in the global compliance space and credited with multiple accolades. His books, over 500 podcasts, regular blog posts, and panel conversations are essential feeders for compliance community globally. Tom is also an author of the award-winning FCPA compliance and ethics blog, an international best-selling book, Lessons Learned on Compliance and Ethics. He is also the author of the seminal text on the nuts and bolts of anti-corruption compliance. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. We also have Sundar from NextDime, who is a director leading the forensic services. Sundar is a chartered accountant and certified fraud examiner with over 15 years of experience in fraud investigations and compliance reviews. He has led several investigation proactive reviews that includes senior management misconduct, conflict of interest, and anti-corruption regulatory compliance investigation. Thanks, Sundar, for joining us. Pleasure, man. Yeah. 
So as a prelude to this webinar, we organized a series of short podcasts with 18 leading anti-corruption practitioners from more than 15 regions and geographies, including US, Latham, UK, France, Germany, Italy, Serbia, Middle Eastern Africa, Australia, China, India, South Korea, Japan, and Singapore to get regional perspective and deeper insight on changing expectation. These 15 minutes conversations were very well received across our channels. The overwhelming response inspired us to develop a thought leadership report that summarizes the learning from podcast conversations and perspective on some of the themes that emerged from the discussion. These are broadly four perspectives that we would like to speak about. Expansive training or of organization resources. Second one is focused third party due diligence. Third one is engagement with business leaders to spread the light, right message on compliances, remote monitoring of controls and program compliances. We will be speaking about these themes in today's webinar. We are also happy to have few speakers, including Brian from US, Simon from UK, Victor from France, Tomislav from Serbia, and Leopoldo from Brazil. It would be great to have them to talk for a few minutes and share their perspective and experience on this initiative. Brian, would you like to share a quick couple of lines on being part of the global campaign? Yes, thank you, everybody, and thanks for um, the introduction and to next time for hosting this series of podcasts, which I think is very timely, very relevant. Uh, I was glad to be invited to participate, and um, I think at this time the world is in a crisis, and we need thought leadership. We need to be connected to each other around the world at a time when we not, cannot be connected in the normal ways. So again, I was very pleased to be invited and to join. Um, and I thank um, those of you who are listening today. Um, what, what we discussed on my podcast was China. And, uh, you know, with the pandemic uh, that we're facing in the world today, I think China has um, increased its level of relevance, but also increased its re level of sensitivity, even if those two things were considered not to be possible before the pandemic. No one could have imagined what, what the situation that we're in now. I certainly had, did not see this coming, and I've been studying U.S.-China relations for 25 years. And this was completely, at least from me, was completely unexpected. So uh, we spoke about China. We spoke about uh, the corruption risks in China, which I think are going to remain high. And I think what we have to start thinking about now is not what happened before or during the pandemic, but what will happen after the pandemic. I think the focus now for companies should be on the aftermath. China, in fact, in many ways is already beyond the pandemic. I was speaking to Shanghai earlier today and they were saying how business is returning to normal. Meetings are happening again in person. Traveling is beginning to resume within China. Meanwhile, if you look at the news, other countries, Brazil, India, and the United States, all of which are, which are represented in this call and on Next Time's podcasts, are seeing more and more cases. And India just passed Brazil and is now the number two country, only behind the U.S., whereas China, ironically, is beginning to return to normal. So it's, it's um, a good lesson for the rest of the world to hopefully think of a time when we too will be beyond the pandemic. Um, and we too then need to focus our efforts on the aftermath, the recovery. What will that mean for companies, for individuals? Lives have been upended, businesses have been destroyed. Um, there will be enormous pressure to make up for the lost year. I think we'll look back on 2020 and basically say it was a, it was a year that was lost to the pandemic. But businesses must continue and revenues must be made and people need to be paid. And, and so there will be enormous pressure uh, from a revenue perspective, from sales, uh, customers, shareholders. And I think that's where the risks will come from in the aftermath of the pandemic. And I'm, uh, I, on the one hand, concerned about the level of risk, but I'm also 
excited to be a part of the effort to reduce those risks. And I think next time and, and, and the other panelists and the people basically who are trying to help companies combat corruption and bribery risks around the world. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Brian, for sharing your perspective. Uh, I'll now move to Simon. Would you like to share a few words, Simon, very quickly? Well, thank you. Um, but I too was very honored to be uh, invited to participate in the program, uh, not just because there were so many distinguished participants, but because it was a truly international panel. And if there's one thing that I've learned in my 30 years of practice is that there are increasingly few borders, at least not when it comes to bribery and corruption, and more importantly, when it comes to bribery and corruption enforcement. If I make a prediction, we're going to see a lot more of that. But this isn't scaremongering, it's a fact of life. Um, enforcement is big business for regulators around the world. Everybody has got with the program. But the one thing the pandemic has caused us is a period of reflection, um, personal, national, political. And I think that people are very sensitized to hardship. Uh, they are sensitized to people doing business in a way that isn't fair isn't on a level playing field and even governments we thought that might have been corrupt in the past understand that there is a movement um, afoot now. I take one example, Brazil, which has made the most extraordinary strides to investigate and to prosecute corruption, taking its lead from major countries such as the United States and I dare say the United Kingdom. And it's bringing about a big change in business and people's thinking over there. And I think this is catching on. I think that uh, compliance is absolutely key. I think that everybody needs to understand that there is going to be more focus on enforcement going forward, in particular, if regulators see that there has been abuse during the pandemic period. And there will be a great appetite for that enforcement amongst the public, press, and parliamentarians. So it's not gonna get any less. In fact, I, I really do predict it's gonna get a lot more intent. Uh, the focus on compliance programs that are actually well designed is going to be acute, uh, but governments and regulators will be making sure that they are properly implemented uh, and that they work in practice. So if there's one plea that I make, it's for organizations that are concerned about their reputation and business in increasingly challenged times. Don't cut back on investment in compliance at the moment. Maintain it even at greater expense if you can because there is going to be a very bright spotlight. Um, I was told right at the beginning of my career, uh, when things like this happen, when there is a downturn or there is a recession, when the tide goes out, the dead bodies float to the surface. And we are gonna see, I'm afraid to say, quite a lot of corpses uh, in business uh, in the future, unless there is major change. So once again, thank you for inviting me to participate. I must endorse everything that Brian said. Um, we are in extraordinary times, but it's going to give rise to extraordinary threats for some. But for those who get it right, extraordinary competitive opportunities. I appreciate Simon uh, uh, for your uh, contribution and uh, words. Uh, Tomislav, how was your experience? Uh, Tomislav, we can't hear you. Uh, maybe you are on mute. Uh, not yet. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Yeah, and for your confidence in me. Uh, it was great, very valid, and necessarily initiative to challenge the global anti-bribery and corruption insights and, and, and its problems. I tried to share with you uh, anti-bribery and corruption development and problems across the Europe and position of OECD and my small part of the world, Central and East, East Europe and Balkan. We should, we should, we should admit that COVID-19 make big changes in our regular business and regular, regular life. And, 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 and related to that also, we, we should, we should said that anti-corruption program should be much more improved because we solved the weak point in, in, in currently anti-corruption program and development. If we agree that, that, that compliance are the minimum uh, necessary house rules in the company and organization, 
we should continue to invest and improve our currently currently programs. Once again, thank you for the invitation, and it was my absolute pleasure to participate. Leopoldo, over to you. Oh, thank you very much for for the invitation. Uh, well, uh, first I would like to congratulate Next Dime for for such a good initiative. I think that uh, it gives us a it, it this kind of uh, podcast and this kind of program organized from India. Give us may give us a different perspective on a traditionally uh, traditional issues which has always been seen from the United States. Uh, as a Brazilian, I, I must say that I welcome this kind of initiative because we, we tend to celebrate diversity and we ignore how much diverse views on the on the same subject may enrich us. I, I recall that during the podcast with Sandar, he posed me some questions that I had never thought about. And I confess that I was, oh, like, what he is talking about? And then I, I realized how important it is to, to have this different view on the same topic. And this is, is very interesting because when we look at anti-corruption, as one of my predecessors said, Brazil has gone through a real revolution. Uh, it's uh, 10 years ago, uh, I would be talking about anti-corruption and it would be only a law in, in the books uh, with very little enforcement and the enforcement was truly frustrating. But then since 10 years, uh, there has been a watershed uh, uh, and everything changed. Uh, I, I recall that the first compliance training I provided 15 years ago, nobody was paying attention. Everyone was looking around and uh, unfocused on what I was speaking. And then uh, I recall last week, everyone was worried. Uh, it was the same company and everyone was worried about, oh, can I get arrested if I give a gift? Which, is, uh, which costs $100 and lots of questions and interactions of this sort. So, so we can see a real cultural change in uh, which was brought upon by a stricter enforcement. And I think that the speakers today, based on their background and their experience, will highlight that there is much more than just implementing compliance program it's necessary to change culture. Of course, that the environment helps a bit. So if you are dealing with a, a, a country where there is no enforcement, uh, people will not pay attention to that. But as in, uh, stronger enforcement arises in many jurisdictions, I think that there will be a change. Just like it happened with third party due diligence here in Brazil, which was a topic nobody paid attention 15 years ago. And nowadays it's a hot topic everyone cares about. So thank you very much for the invitation to, to for the podcast and to be here. And I'm very happy to, to contribute however uh, you need for this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leopoldo. Uh, Victor, a few lines to sum up our engagement with you? Um, sure. Um, it's hard not to repeat what um, you know all of my colleagues have said. Um, but thank you so much for the opportunity. It was it was great to contribute to this um, to the podcast. It was also great, you know, to speak with um, Sundar when we were talking and when we were doing the podcast about you know everything that he had heard before. Um, and then in the end, uh, all the podcasts that were made, it's true that the, the current circumstances, you know, have put in place new ways of working, a new environment. Um, you always, I mean, generally you constantly have to adapt, but it's even more present now. Um, 
the laws in France uh, on anti-corruption are quite new. I mean, they're from 2017. We're trying to follow what Brazil and what the UK um, are doing. But, you know, at, at this stage, compliance officers are really facing some struggles in this new environment in, in which they have to adapt not only to the legal environment, which was changing in the, in the past years, but now to the ways that people are working and to the new methods that we are that we that we need to face and that we need to put in place. Um, so it's it's great to hear from all the countries, from all the and to know what's going on in the different legislations as well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for your comments. We sincerely appreciate you being able to spare time and join us today. With these thoughts, we are happy to present the face of global corruption in COVID-19, a thought leadership publication brought to you by Next Time. We hope uh, you are as excited as we are. We will share a copy with you after this webinar. You can also download one from social media channels after tomorrow. We would love to hear your comments, opinions and views. Please feel free to reach out to any of the speakers in case you have any questions. Let us get going with our webinar. Over to you Sundar for taking it forward. Thanks Mayank. Um, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here um, uh, and share the stage with Tom and Amy, and um, uh, thanks a lot for uh, all the panelists who actually spoke on the podcast uh, uh, and also reflected upon their perspective of how they see anti-corruption coming along. Um, like Man briefly mentioned, uh, the context of the webinar, we're going to be covering aspects relating to expansive training, focused third-party due diligence, engagement with business leaders to spread the right message and also create an influence, and looking at remote monitoring of controls. I just want to uh, start this uh, with the current context. Um, I just want to jump into uh, asking quick perspective to Tom. Tom, um, how do you see the current anti-corruption environment shaping along? The key theme for me for anti-corruption environment is the same key theme that I see from the coronavirus health crisis, and that is change. And it's not change that's particularly new changes that we've seen uh, start in 2018 and 2019, but they're moving it at light speed now. So that you have to have the ability to be nimble, to shift, uh, to look at new business opportunities, to look at new business risks, and be able to respond to those in a coherent uh, fashion that you can document so if the regulator comes knocking two, three, five years down the road, you'll be able to explain, this is what we did, and this is how and why we did it. So it's the speed of change. Uh, I think it was Simon, or perhaps Brian, who talked about, it was Brian, who talked about the uh, dynamics in China now, and that's the perfect example of why you need to be able to adapt from an anti-corruption uh, perspective. Absolutely. Uh, Amy, you want to add um, uh, your quick perspective on the current anti-corruption environment? And I you think engage that, with a lot of um, legal yeah. compliance leaders. Thank you. I have clients that are still working on their deferred prosecutions from years ago. So the tale is so long. Um, and I would say for them, it moves just steadily. Things haven't changed. It's just been harder to get the data and harder to have their board meetings and their monitorship work. Um, done because of the impact on in-person travel and how that can relate to monitoring and auditing. I think that it's important, and several people commented on this, to beware of what might be perceived as a sleeping giant with regard to enforcement. I think we always see that there's um, a little bit of a lag time perhaps in times like this, but uh, then suddenly it's not, and it's quite swift. And so I'll be curious as to when that is, um, but I feel like everything, we're just in a little bit of a lull, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be substantial follow-up activity for anything that's been inappropriate being conducted during this quieter time. So. 
Perfect. Yeah. Um, uh, Amy, would you like to start off with this? Sure. Do you want to move on to the next question? Okay, great. Yes. So to Tom, what are the training channels that compliance officers shall adopt and what suggestions would you have to make them more innovative? So Amy, uh, I think the, the key theme for me from uh, certainly the U.S. Department of Justice around training has been focused training and effective training. Uh, you, what you need to identify is your employees who are at the highest risk. Uh, that risk obviously can change. The risk of an employee engaging in bribery and corruption on March 1st was very different than the risk today, simply because of the lack of travel. Um, so, but you need to focus on uh, and determine who the employees at risk are, uh, who the employees at less risk are. You need to deliver some sort of generalized training to those who are at less risk, but those who are at higher risk, who are engaging with state-owned enterprises or dealing with foreign officials on a regular basis, uh, you need to give them specialized training. There is a variety of, of different ways we can you can do that, and we can go into the, some of those later, but I think the most important thing is to have a risk-based approach to training that once again is documented. Uh, I've never had uh, been on a next time uh, podcast, so you're going to hear this, Sundar, for the first time. But the three most important things of any compliance program, literally, are document, document, document. Whatever you do, document it. And I've said that for 10 years, so I get to say it again. Whatever you do, document. Uh, and the same is around training and determining the risk-based uh, nature of the of, of your employees. So doc, uh, determine who, what employees need high risk training, what employees can have lesser training, lesser risk or lower risk training, and then document that, and then focus your efforts on those employees who do need that high risk training and train them appropriately. Absolutely. Uh, Amy, I just want to add one more point uh, to what Tom said in that. See, um, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely necessary to look at innovative ways to explore uh, training channels, right? Because um, uh, um, I think compliance and ethics are not very different from personal ethics per se. We all have, we all come from cultures where we have um, <clears throat> rich ethics that is embedded as part of our um, life per se. What is important is to put it in a different way, the innovative way that engages or clicks with people. So uh, whether it is games or whether it is um, uh, engaging AVs. And uh, I'm also a fan of uh, what Tom does in terms of um, uh, connecting movies and compliance or uh, uh, bringing in perspectives which are relatable. And that actually brings in um, a connective approach so that people are able to relate to actions that they do in their workplace and then align it to that. True, all, all very important. And in terms of the training channels that compliance officers shall adopt, what are suggestions to make those innovative? So, uh, and I really would like to hear your perspective on this, Amy, but I think one of the greatest things about being a compliance officer is you're only limited by your imagination. If you can think of it, you can do it. If you can think of a way to communicate a concept, you can do it. Uh, that can be a audio as the three of us. It can be an audio visual as the three of us. It can be in writing. Uh, it can be uh, old style classroom training. It can be a game. Uh, it can be a real world example. Um, there are plenty of uh, litany of FCPA enforcement actions that we use on a regular basis uh, for training going forward. Um, in my case, uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, Shakespeare, uh, Winnie the Pooh. Uh, there's a wide variety of characters that I've used uh, to communicate my thoughts about compliance and compliance communication and compliance training. So um, I think the, the thing is, to, uh, as I mentioned before, once you've determined who is the high risk, who are the high risk employees, you tailor your training for those employees and you deliver it through a variety of mediums so that it doesn't st become stale and it allows the uh, continuous flow of information. And once again, as the uh, compliance uh, function, you can document that you've delivered the training if uh, the regulators ever come knocking. 
the thing I would emphasize though is feedback because it's not a one-way street. It's not one-way communication. What does the receiver of the communication, i.e. the employee think? Is it useful? Does it have anything to do with the real world? Uh, if not, why not? And how do you incorporate that back into your next level and next round of training? So I almost see this as a continuous loop as well, but I think the beauty of, and one of the reasons I enjoy being a compliance uh, practitioner is literally you're only limited by your imagination. So if you can think of a way to do something, um, you can do it. And that is uh, the same when it comes to training, same when it comes to communications. Those are all good points. I had written a top 10 training things to keep in mind for Compliance Week a few months ago that I'd be happy to send to anyone. But um, playing off of what Tom sent, I think that um, kind of three key points to have effective training are mostly around being, being respectful of your audience. <clears throat> and how you can do that is to number one, be relevant. Number two, to be culturally literate, depending on what jurisdiction and what country you're in. And third, recognizing adult learning principles in terms of using stories, um, being tight with your time and not going on and on. Shorter bursts are always more relevant for folks and having nice emotional hooks around a story is what's really gonna bring Tom in and um, things like he mentioned around movies and characters are going to create a story that are going to be engaging for an adult mind to be able to engage and remember the concepts. Um, things that I like doing in some of my teaching at, at Stanford and UC Berkeley Haas on ethics involve breakout rooms and we use case studies based on real cases that have happened in ethics and compliance and then posit questions and then we split out into smaller groups so that they can discuss and uh, keep it interactive. The last thing that I would say is having two-way communication with your training to the extent that you can design training to not only push out information to the audience, but also provide information back to the compliance department as a measure of culture and as a feedback loop for potential issues, that's where I see a lot of companies going with their designs. And um, it makes it a lot more meaningful and helpful with regard to making the program something that's truly owned by the employees and something that is a partnership between compliance and employees. Absolutely, Amy, actually, um, I, I completely buy that the two-way communication is absolutely essential. And that's where I come to uh, the other point that I wanted to ask you, Amy, um, in terms of most of the ethics and compliance officers have a plan, communication plan for the year, which includes how they want to communicate the essentials of policy and awareness messages. Uh, one of the things that I've constantly noticed is that there is a need to shift from communication plan to communication strategy with regard to ethics and compliance because your thought process is going to be very different from um, uh, the plan to a strategic approach of dealing with ethics and compliance communications. Would you like to add uh, some thoughts in that area? Sure, I would say that both as a former chief compliance officer at McKesson and then also as a chief human resources officer at a publicly traded bank, I, are, I start with the strategy first in terms of what is the overarching goal. And to me, that's usually making sure senior leadership um, talks the walk and walks the talk and that we are aligned in terms of their messaging, that they're aware of major key initiatives that will be going on for the year that I'm invited to all major meetings where I need to be sharing this information and that the strategy has an embedded change management component to it in terms of where do I think are the hot spots, what areas of the company perhaps have not embraced compliance in the past, either through misconduct issues or just not being engaged in the training. And I set my strategy around over rotating on, on those key areas. Then the actual plan um, kind of writes itself. I think if you start with the strategy, you already know what success looks like. And so then you can say, okay, I need to have quarterly meetings with 
um, the HR team. I need to have quarterly meetings with communication so that I can get on their schedule and they can let me know what critical meetings I need to be at. Or I can give them some talking points to where they're about to hand that to the CEO as she walks on stage. She can just embed those in her speech. Um, if you have these tight relationships strategically, you can be in 10 places at once, um, which is very important since our resources are usually not so rich. Um, so it's important to think through all of that. What are some of your ideas? Uh, absolutely. So I think uh, um, uh, I, I've also seen this constantly where sometimes uh, a communication plan is put in more like a awareness plan, right? An awareness plan is a limited perspective of looking at a communication plan and uh, a much limited perspective of looking at it as a communication strategy. Um, and at some of the thoughts that uh, Tom said in, when he was responding to the previous thing um, in terms of uh, using innovative approaches is absolutely essential and it ties in well. If you have a theme and if you're able to drive the theme um, uh, actively and your key stakeholders are aligned to the theme, it automatically translates into better impact outcomes so that's uh, what i personally um, feel yeah so i think that that was my thought on that particular perspective great then the next point that i wanted to actually get to is tom uh, to you <clears throat> um there are a number of companies which actually moves from uh, a typical um, they're they're short of resources uh, amy mentioned it when she was referring it they were short of resources and they normally leverage um, compliance councils or ethics champions, as they call it, who are shared resources who spare about 10% uh, of time uh, in their roles. They may be from finance, they may be from uh, HR, they may be from legal and legal as the case may be, but they spare the time for them to contribute to ethics and compliance. Um, uh, how do you think organizations should start thinking of using them in driving ethics-based culture? So uh, I guess the first thing I would say is not only, not simply think about doing it, do it, uh, because it's an extraordinarily powerful way to improve your overall uh, compliance program and drive an ethics-based culture. By having a local uh, ethics champion uh, on site, uh, away from the home office, away from the corporate office, uh, access accessible to employees, you do several different things. One, you put an ethics champion literally on the front lines, and that's where you want uh, your ethics-based culture to be the, the best on the front lines. But two, you have a resource there for everyone else so that you have a specially trained uh, compliance counselor or ethics champion uh, out on the front line, and he's available to all the other employees. Um, he also is therefore able to provide information and data back to the corporate compliance function. So you have this, once again, continuous loop of information. And uh, by having this continuous flow of information, it can make your, and it will make your compliance program and your culture much more robust. You do need to provide training uh, to this compliance counselor. Uh, you can't just uh, give them a title and send them out there. But once you give them the training and show them that they're going to have the support from you in the compliance function, this can be an extraordinarily powerful tool for the compliance function. But let me talk about it, at least give a few words about why I think it's so important from the employee perspective. Um, having an ethics champion, having a compliance counselor in the field really drives home the message uh, that this company will take ethics and compliance very seriously. It drives home the message that we not only do we value this and we expect it, but we're going to provide resources to you, the employee. And you can talk to this employee, excuse me, you can talk to this ethics champion and get the help that you need to solve any problems that you need. So it's a it's a very powerful model. Uh, it operationalizes compliance in a way that uh, cannot be done unless you're literally on the front lines. It allows the compliance, corporate compliance function to have insight, input, and ears literally on the ground. Uh, so there's that uh, component as well. And it's a, um, a very strong way. You can use this model to build it out even more if you want to build into uh, from a local model to a regional model. 
uh, say you're a US company and you wanna put this in India, well, you have multiple compliance counselors and they report into a, uh, a regional compliance committee, but the regional compliance committee is made up of regional uh, executives so that you have uh, the same structure above the local compliance champion, but that structure is receiving information and input. So you can use it in a variety of ways. It's a great way to more, more fully operationalize your compliance program and drive home the day-to-day ethics-based culture of an organization. Absolutely. Uh, Tom, I've, I've seen this uh, uh, very effectively when uh, there are more compliance champions that you're able to engage. One of the things that happens is that um, um, it, it becomes easier to align different functions or different uh, the people operating in different regions to a common principle because uh, it's not a, a central communication that is impacting um, the, the factories, the warehouses, as the case may be. You have representatives from those segments who are able to actually um, deal with it very, very effectively. And that also synchronizes across the organization and the messages are very, very effective. And, and I really appreciate the pointer that um, you shared. Um, uh, So um, now I get to ask you a question, Sundar. So uh, due diligence is mm -hmm. always a critical element in compliance. But what I wanted to ask is why is due diligence a critical need for developing countries that have limited digital databases or even published data? How do you deal with that issue? Uh, absolutely. Tom, uh, the uh, primary thing is that uh, we're actually speaking about availability of data and accessibility of data when it comes to due diligence, right? Um, gathering of information about a third party and understanding the risks associated with the third party. There are two ways in uh, which uh, organizations do. One is to gather from information that is available in the databases or uh, in, in global records. Second is to see on ground uh, how they're able to inquire and seek that information either through interview process or through subsidiary engagement models. Uh, now the challenge here, uh, it is critical for developing countries because most of these developing economies may not have complete data set, uh, which is in digital way. So if we speak, if we are speaking about, let's say, litigation records, if we are speaking about records relating to um, sanctions, not all of these will be uh, completely available in digital record. Let's say, if I have to give an example, this is true for some of the geographies that we operate in. If we speak about India or if we speak about uh, UAE, you won't have complete details of organizations which are currently under investigation on public records. So what you won't have is that even if the organization or the third party that you are um, conducting due diligence of, they may not have a registered case appearing at this point in time as part of the litigation records, but they may be currently under investigation. So it becomes really critical from that perspective. So my honest suggestion is to look at alternative ways of conducting due diligence in developing economies uh, where it is necessary for compliance officers to evaluate the extent to which due diligence information can be gathered and they're able to balance it out. Yeah, so I think that aspect is going to be very, very critical. Very good. So uh, Sundar, as I know you're aware on um, in June, the U.S. Department of Justice issued updated uh, guidance uh, in the form of evaluation of corporate compliance programs. And they talked about continuous monitoring. So I wanted to ask you, how does continuous monitoring of controls help in a global anti-corruption compliance program? Yeah, so um, thanks, Tom, for that uh, question. So uh, I wanted to just clarify this at, uh, at the outset that Continuous monitoring is not just limited to transactional monitoring. I would like to classify it into broadly three parts. Part number one is dealing with compliance program related monitoring. Second is relating to processes and transaction related monitoring. And the third piece is relating to dealing with incident management. 
Um, we've seen in the recent past that the Department of Justice has been giving a lot of stress on um, how incident management is managed by the organization and how there are consistency in decisions for violations that happen. It, it needs to be considered from a holistic perspective on those, all these three levels. And when we speak about controls monitoring, I look at about uh, eight broader parameters. This will touch almost every process um, that an, an organization has, be it a due diligence or a be it a sales process. It uh, basically starts with the management commitment. This could be regional management. This could be functional management as the case may be. Management commitment, communication and clarity. How the policy is communicated and how clear the policy and expectations are. Then the third point that comes in is risk acceptance and uh, uh, incentives. Um, a lot of organizations conduct a lot of risk assessments, right? Um, and they have a mitigation factors around it. Uh, but what gets missed out is there are also risks that they accept beyond just assessment which they think are not very critical and they incentivize. A simpler example to put across in this is that if you're operating in a high risk geography and uh, you have an incentive plan where in, uh, if, uh, if uh, you're operating in a high risk geography where your major customer is a government customer and you have uh, a significantly higher target or expectation from the senior management for sales or revenues, that is what I'm speaking about as risk acceptance and incentives. When you start correlating risk acceptance and incentives, it gives a different perspective. Uh, then it's about um, controls monitoring and also expectations and measurement. How do you create a set of expectations and how do you monitor those ex expectations at a process level? Uh, how your continuous control monitoring, monitoring of regular controls, this could be transactional financial controls, or uh, it could be due diligence related controls. How do they operate? Uh, then three other factors that I think are critical or stakeholder engagement. Um, I think uh, I, we will touch upon this when um, uh, we go to subsequent sections and I would want Amy to uh, share some insights about it. I consider stakeholder engagement as very, very critical. If um, uh, compliance is not deeply engaging with stakeholders, then that's going to be a challenge area. Uh, then we have a uh, budget and resources. Do we, does the compliance team has adequate budget and resources for them to manage the overall controls? For me, con compliance monitoring is about all these factors, not just about governance and reporting factor. That's how I see it. Excellent. Perfect. So if I could perhaps uh, now ask the both of you to weigh in on this next question. How to leverage other functional departments, including finance, HR, internal audit, legal, into driving ethics and compliance. Amy, I know you've had to deal with that and you're already smiling. <laughs> I was going to see if Sundar wanted to go first, but I'm happy to. Um, gosh, I've held a lot of these roles myself, so um, that always was helpful in getting me cross-functional collaboration. I've been a general counsel, I've been a chief compliance officer, and I've been a chief human resources officer. Um, and I've overseen IT and communications and other jobs. So I would say that having had the perspective I do that um, it's really important to build the relationships. Um, these groups all have more in common than they don't. And if you can show them that, and that you understand their business and the pressures that are on them first before trying to ask them a favor, or ask them for help, you will get a lot further. I think the best way to start a relationship is, is by giving. And so in these cases, it's by learning what are the pressures that, that audit or your other colleagues are under? What do their, um, what's, you know, how precarious is their leadership position? Do they have good sponsorship? Do they have the resources they need? Um, what do they have to achieve by the end of the year? What are their obstacles? If you know these things, you're getting to know their business pretty well, which can then help you in multiple ways, not only in building the relationship, but also in potentially collaborating on areas that they may have weaknesses in. You can potentially offer resources if it's something that's on your plan that you actually need to achieve as well. You can get synergies and economies of scale once you get more deeply embedded into HR or audits processes. And I think that's really important um, to find that common ground and to develop common goals. 
um, that was always something that that a kind of a web of relationships that I built that was a really big safety net in times when I might be short staffed or I might not have eyes and ears on the ground to see a particular issue going on. My colleagues were educated to see my viewpoint and know that I would care. There are many times that HR might not know that something is a compliance issue if we haven't educated them, just like we might not know that a manager is breaking a major HR policy. If we have not paid attention, we don't know when we can be helpful. And I think that it's very important for all of our functions to work together because we are often understaffed, underappreciated, and the first one that gets blamed when something gets wrong. And so that's why I feel that this group of uh, oversight functions can always be such an effective collegial team if the work is done on the relationships upside. Absolutely, Amy. I think uh, I totally agree with what you said. Uh, uh, I just want to add um, uh, um, some examples of uh, um, experimentations that always work. Um, for example, um, your finance team uh, can definitely look at the front line of controls that they are looking at in terms of payment process or even transactional process uh, that are critical from a anti-corruption compliance perspective. Uh, the human resource colleagues can be a good support in uh, compiling information on uh, employee pulse, compliance awareness, as the case may be, right? Um, where they do a number of uh, uh, employee assessment surveys, so they may be in a position to integrate uh, things that you need from a compliance awareness perspective and then get a, perspective, get a collective understanding of things. Uh, internal audit colleagues, can definitely be helpful in compliance reviews that you want to do. And uh, the legal colleagues could be um, supportive in conducting trainings as part of their larger legal awareness programs that they probably do. Uh, I think these are functions which are going to bring in elements which uh, uh, a lean compliance team will be in a position to effectively leverage. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So why is it imperative to develop critical metrics and scorecards to drive the compliance agenda and compliance maturity? Tom so, and so um, Yeah, um, uh, 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 I'll just start off. Um, uh, the thing that I think is very critical in this is that uh, when we're looking at metrics, um, so you did mention about how you create a set of relationships within the organization groups and you, the metrics becomes a clear form of reflecting expectations. And these expectations are agreed upon by a group of management people. Then it automatically percolates downward where you're not trying to communicate the expectations at multi levels. That is one of the critical factors that I've seen when you're dealing with. Uh, people from multiple jurisdictions. Um, another factor uh, that I have seen is that um, it's uh, it's not unusual when we actually look at um, uh, look at alternative uh, uh, scorecards, right? When you, a specific scorecard helping to measure anti-corruption um, or a maturity kind of a model is always helpful to reassess where you stand and where you uh, evolving towards. That's my perspective. Over to you, Tom. So the um, what you need to do is create an inventory of metrics. A compliance function needs an inventory of metrics. And I was actually sorry, I was writing down what you were saying, Sundar. I found it so powerful. Um, to uh, and with that inventory of metrics, then you can then uh, test your system. And I really liked your phrasing, Sundar. I'm not sure I wrote it down right, but you have an agreed set of expectations. Uh, and if you have agreement, first of all, you have the expectation written down, then you have an agreement on what that expectation is. Well, now you have a set of metrics uh, that you can use that moving forward. And if a compliance uh, practitioner, chief compliance officer uh, has an inventory of metrics, they can then uh, test, retest, continuously monitor and continually improve your compliance program. And once again, if the regulators ever come knocking, you have the metrics you have created, why you've created them, how you've created them, how you've used them, and most importantly, how you've taken that information and looped it back in to improve your compliance program.
Yeah, absolutely. So this comes to the next point. Um, uh, I just want to come back to you, Amy, and then understand from you um, is that what are the essentials uh, for ethics and compliance officers uh, to think about or do to do to get the seat among strategic business advisors? Yeah, it's critical in our roles to have to get a seat at the table with our stakeholders. Um, in my executive coaching, what really comes up for people in getting a seat at the table is needing people to trust you. And people trust you when they do two things. Number one, they know that you care about them. And number two, you are open to their influence and you demonstrate that they can influence you. It's, it's interesting. Um, so the key skills that you need are, are good listening skills, demonstrating empathy for their goals and what they're needing to accomplish, and then good intent. And those sound very fluffy, but literally it's what all good relationships are built upon, um, trust. And I would say that having good business acumen, knowing their profit and loss statement, again, knowing their goals and their obstacles, being a business person and coming to the table um, as someone who wants to serve the business and understands the P&L responsibilities and is going to support compliance within that risk regime um, is important in terms of getting a seat at the table. Where it gets tough is where um, compliance seems like it's other and when, it, when it's not integrated into the business and when it is viewed as an outside kind of auditing function, that's when I think there's a risk. But I would love your thoughts on this. Uh, I think I absolutely agree to it. Uh, uh, Tom, do you want to add up to that perspective because it's a very critical thought? Uh, uh, no, she's she's spot on. I would only say that you must demonstrate competence. Uh, you've got to know how to read a spreadsheet, and but more importantly, you have to know the business. If you don't know the business, then you can't advise them. So uh, that's I think that's one of the great things about being a compliance officer. Is you get to learn everything. So, uh, but you have to have, uh, demonstrate competence. Absolutely. Um, with that, uh, we are we're in our last qu uh, question. I just wanted to bounce this off to you, Amy and Tom. Um, it is necessary for ethics and compliance officers to start influencing leaders uh, so that they are able to drive uh, ethics functions more effectively. From the context perspective, what are the triggers uh, that they need to consider and what are the pitfalls they need to be mindful of? Do you want to start, Tom? Or sure. Um, obviously, it does all start at the top, but you have to have commitment from management or the, the leaders. But it's not commitment simply to say the right thing. Amy has already hit it. You got to walk the walk. You have to talk the talk. You have to, and you actually, I think, talked about uh, incentive compensation all the way down to incentive compensation. Are you incentivizing people uh, to engage in? activities that violate the company's own ethical standards, let alone engage in bribery and corruption. So it, it is a leader who is committed to having an ethical-based culture throughout their organization and is willing to put the time and effort and some money, but mainly time and effort into it and to continually reinforce that message uh, at all turns. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, from your side, what's your perspective on this? I agree completely with Tom, and I think that understanding your target audience's perspective is critical, answering what's in it for me, why should they care, how is it relevant um, to their business, as Tom pointed out, and you tailor your communications accordingly. Uh, absolutely. I think at the end of the day, the broader perspective is that uh, you, you need to have clarity on um, how you're going to communicate it, and uh, they need to know um, why you care about it. And uh, um, that is an essential messaging that's going to be critical for them to be in sync with this. If we are able to uh, influence leaders, they are able to bring in more values uh, to the table. Um, I, I really thank both of you for sharing insights on uh, the pointers that we exchanged. I think uh, uh, it's been an interesting discussion. I would uh, now hand it over to Mayak.
No, do you have any uh, question answer before I take it forward? Um, uh, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed being part of an international presentation such as this. And I think this is a, a fabulous format that you guys have put together. So thanks for doing this. Thanks for inviting myself and Amy, of course, to be a part of this. I don't get to do something like this. I don't think I've ever done it. So uh, <laughs> it's excellent. That is great. Thank you Fantastic. all. Yeah, and that's, a, that's a pleasure from us. So, uh, you know, I would like to extend an heartfelt thank you to everyone, to our listeners from across the world, to Amy and Tom and Sundar for their insightful contribution, to Brian, Victor, Tomislav, Leopoldo, Simon, and all other leaders for their efforts in making this thought leadership a success. Thank you team at Next Time that has been working hard behind the scene. And just at the cost of repetition, if you have any questions in line with the discussions today that we are or we were unable to address due to the time constraint, we welcome you to reach out to us at thinknext at nextdime.com and our team would be happy to respond offline. Across the globe, we think next at nextdime and we invite you to do the same. We welcome your feedback on today's presentation. Be vigilant, stay safe. Thank you and goodbye. Thank, thank you, everybody. everybody. Thanks, Tom and Amy, and um, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Bye.